Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another Q&A video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian McCollum, and because I am filming this in the morning before lunch, there's no scotch here, instead uh, we're going to do a little morning pick-me-up shot of uh, Agua Chiltepin, which is basically uh, vinegar, garlic, ginger, and a whole crap load of peppers. That will wake you up in the morning. Ah, it's a good southwestern morning to you. Ah, that is also a really good uh, source of electrolytes if you've been out in the desert heat all day, which I have not today. But anyway, uh, as usual, all of our questions today come from the fantastic folks who support Forgotten Weapons on Patreon. We'll talk about that a little more at the end, but to dig right into this, our first question is from Fun Firepower, who says, Do you believe that there is any kind of future in quote-unquote balanced recoil or other technologies besides muzzle brakes and sheer mass in reducing or otherwise eliminating felt recoil? I think, yeah, actually there might be. I have still yet to have a chance to actually shoot a balanced recoil gun. Um, there are a few developmental ones out there, aside from the Russian family of, of rifles. I would love to get a chance to shoot one. Uh, Larry Vickers tells me that they are fantastic. And that's one of those places where you might be able to get enough benefit out of uh, the improvement to justify all the extra mechanical complexity that goes into the system. In addition, uh, if they stay popular and stay in development, we might actually see people developing less complex and more more ruggedized, I suppose, balanced recoil systems. And there might actually be a thing there. I don't think it'll be transformative, uh, but it could be something that does become popular and does become a more common feature of new infantry rifles. Uh, Franz says, is there a place for eight millimeter Kurtz today? And if not, what is its natural successor? No, I don't think there is any place for eight Kurtz other than as a historical interest thing. Um, it'll always be there for people who have rifles like Sturmgewehrs and they want to be able to shoot them. Uh, the problem with 8mm Kurtz is that it's based on 8mm Mauser, which has a relatively large case head. If you're going to make a small, intermediate sized cartridge, you don't need to have a really large diameter case head. And if you do, you're, you're creating an issue of a very long stack of cartridges. If you look at an MP44 uh, magazine, they're ludicrously long for only holding 30 rounds. It's the length of like a 40 round uh, AR-15 magazine in 5.56, or a, almost a 45 round 5.45 magazine. Uh, and they did that simply for commonality with the existing case head and machinery. Uh, the natural successor, I think, is really the 762 by 39 millimeter cartridge, which has not identical, but quite similar ballistics. Uh, was intended for the same style of weapon and does the same job, but you'll notice it's a significantly smaller case head, which leads to a more compact magazine, allows you to have a longer magazine or more ammo for the same magazine length, allows you to get closer on the ground and prone. Um, eight millimeter Kurtz is never coming back. Uh, it was a good compromise at the time, but the conditions have changed. And there's no justification for it today. Uh, Lubosch says, was there any attempt to build an M1 carbine in 223? An interesting question. Uh, the easy answer is no, but also yes. So the problem is the receiver for an M1 carbine is simply too short to accommodate a 556 by 45 millimeter cartridge. It won't fit. So no, no one has ever converted the M1 carbine to 556. However, the more interesting and slightly longer answer is that yes, in two different ways it has been done. So in the 1950s, when the US military was working on what it called the small, velo small caliber high velocity series of trials that would eventually lead to 223, uh, they did actually neck down uh, 30 carbine to 22 caliber. It was a bottlenecked cartridge. Uh, it was developed by an engineer by the name of Gustafsson, and they converted some M1 carbines to this 22 caliber high velocity cartridge. Basically, as as close as you could get to 556, which wasn't actually that cartridge wasn't a thing yet, but as close as you could get to that cartridge within the overall length confines of a pre-existing M1 carbine receiver. Uh, this is similar to the 5.7 Spitfire cartridge that would be um, sold commercially with 
in the M1 carbine, in commercial M1 carbines. So they did some testing on that. Uh, they then went on, when they had the, the first uh, light rifle trials, in addition to the AR-15, they also looked at a development, a rifle that was submitted by Winchester, the uh, in caliber 224 Winchester, which is very similar to 223. Um, this was the Winchester light rifle, and it was basically a scaled up M1 carbine. It uses the same gas tappet system, it uses the exact same style of operating rod, of rotating bolt, two lugs, open topped receiver. Um, I, I know there's one of them. Actually, there might be a couple of them at the Cody Firearms Museum. They have been on my list to film there for a while, and I just haven't ever quite gotten to them with the stack of other guns that I film there when I have a chance. Uh, one of those Winchester light rifles is very much very high on my priority list to film for you guys. Uh, but that is, in effect, a 5.56 caliber M1 carbine. So yeah, a couple different ways that they actually tried to do it. Uh, phase says, how is Floatplane working out for you? Are they good to work with? Are you getting subscribers there? Uh, Floatplane, by the way, is an alternative viewer support platform uh, that was developed by basically a Linus, well, a channel called Linus Tech Tips. Um, the, who, it's a bunch of technology-oriented channels who wanted something, uh, an alternative to Patreon and also an alternative to YouTube. And so Floatplane is kind of a combination of the two. Uh, it is. It exists solely as a platform for viewer support of video channels. It hosts its own content independently. So money donated there doesn't go quite, not quite as much of it comes to me as money on Patreon because Floatplane does its own video hosting. If you're a member on Floatplane, you can watch videos, my videos, there instead of watching them on YouTube. And that, of course, costs money to host. So it's a fair system. I like it. I really like having a backup to YouTube and to Patreon. Um, the downside to Floatplane is it is explicitly not intended to be like a mainstream video channel. There's no discovery, they don't, well there are no ads, which is a nice thing. There's also no suggestion of, oh you liked this, you should also check out that. None of that. This is just, you like Forgotten Weapons? Here's Forgotten Weapons channel. You can log in, look at whatever videos you like. Uh, so within those limitations, yes, I very much like Floatplane. Um, I got, I think I have, I've got a decent number of people over there. It's a small fraction as many as on Patreon. Um, as I said, I, given the choice at this point, as long as Patreon continues to exist, which I don't see it going away anytime soon. By the way, there is some recent hullabaloo about Patreon and some lawsuits. From my view of it, having looked into it, I don't think it's going to be anything substantial. And I'm not at all concerned about Patreon going away because of it. Um, that said, I'm wandering here quite a bit. Uh, Floatplane is great to work with. Floatplane is a great solution for people who don't like Patreon and who, or people who really don't like YouTube. Um, so it is my my preferred alternative for both of those platforms. And if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, check them out. I'll have a link in the description text below. Uh, next up, Isaac says, it seems that the gunsmith trade is in steep decline as those with skills to repair our old firearms retire or pass on. Newfangled precision CNC'd Lego guns are great, but the old stuff, uh, great, but the old stuff, well, that's why we are here. Have you experienced any challenges in finding someone who can perform quality work? What do you look for when selecting a shop to send an old heirloom off to? I agree on pretty much all of these points. Um, in fact, to the to the extent that I kind of generally avoid gunsmithing work in the first place. Uh, I don't take on, I try not to take on project rifles. Um, I think the issue here, and one could be rather disparaging in these sorts of this assessment, but I'll try and do it in the most neutral way possible. I think the issue is that most people are not willing to pay for the amount of labor and expertise that's required for real gunsmithing. Gunsmithing that goes beyond, like, I can't remember how to put this back together, could you fix it? Or I'd like you to mount and zero this scope. Or I'm just lazy and I'd like to pay you to clean a gun. That sort of stuff, no big deal. Typical gun shop will have a gunsmith who can do all of that sort of stuff and they're probably bored out of their mind doing it. True gunsmithing is in, you know, the sort of thing that requires someone to know how to build a gun from scratch is it takes a lot of education, a lot of experience, a lot of skill, a lot of talent, uh, a lot of dedication and time. And most people are not willing to pay 
what that talent requires. And so what we have, I think, are mostly, are, are really good gunsmiths, are old guys who have developed the skills over a very long period who do it because it's a passion. And they just, they, they really enjoy doing the work. They're not doing it for the money, which is, and, and usually they are retired or have some other alternative source of income or they paid for their house 20 years ago. And so they don't need maybe as much uh, income. You know, kids have moved out. There are no more college payments. The mortgage is paid off. The car is paid off. Okay, we can get by with a little less money um, and they can support themselves doing gunsmithing at a comfortably slow pace where they just still enjoy it. And props to those guys for being able to take something that they really enjoy and, and making a living on it and doing it. Uh, however, it's not the sort of... you can't go to those guys and expect the sort of turnkey, you know, it's not like Amazon. You don't hand them the gun and go, okay, you'll have it back in three days, perfect and it'll cost th exactly this amount, and if it's not perfect, then you'll refund my money. Yeah, none of that applies to gunsmiths. Uh, it will take longer than you expect. It will cost more than you expect. Um, if the gunsmith's good, uh, it will be a fantastic product when they're done, but if the gunsmith's not the greatest, it might not work. There might be, it might be rough around the edges. There might be details that you don't like, and that's kind of par for the course, as in my experience, with guys who are doing this as a passion and not because they have to. Um, so that's, uh, if I had an old heirloom I wanted restored, I honestly don't know. I, I don't have anyone in particular that I would send it to. Um, I know a lot of people are going to talk about Mark Novak, um, which is great. Uh, he did in fact do some restoration work on one of my revolvers. Um, that was something he wanted to do for a video. Uh, but I would not go out of my way. Frankly, I think he's got a lot of workload and I, I just prefer to leave guns as they are myself. Tim says, I missed out on the Chasseau de Famas offering. Any chance this will be offered again with another printing? Again, yes and also no. Uh, we do plan to reprint Chasseau de Famas, but it's not going to be for a while, probably a couple of years. Um, the reason is I am working on other projects. Uh, if we're going to do a reprint, it's really not a, as simple of a matter as uh, just clicking a button and having another thousand books show up. There's a substantial uh, monetary investment required to print a bunch of books in advance. That's part of the reason we did the Kickstarter, uh, was to fund that. And if we're going to reprint it, I want to take the opportunity to fix some of the small errors that are in it. You know, that sort of thing always crops up, and I've got a list of of fixes to make in the next edition. And to be frank, I'd like to add some more material to it. I have come across a bunch of a bunch more material on the Chasse in particular, and I'd love to be able to add some chapters on things like some of the training rifles, perhaps, um, like the Moss 45, or the PGM precision guns, or the Tabatiers. And I can't, like, that's going to require me to dedicate a substantial amount of time to revising the manuscript. So if we're going to reprint it, I want to do it that way. Um, and it'll take a little time before we get there. Uh, that said, we do have a small number of copies that we set aside to offer as bundles in other book Kickstarters. So we had some of those offered with uh, Jonathan Ferguson's book on British bullpups, and when we run our next Kickstarter, which should be before the end of the year or right at the end of the year, uh, we will also have another small batch of Chasse de Famas copies to offer as package deals uh, for folks on that next book. We have two questions here about the M14. Uh, John says, with the glorious return to battle rifles to beat Chinese body armor, will the M14 be relevant again? Uh, the answer there is no. It's an interesting thing that um, you get, yes, you get some advantage in armor penetration with a larger bullet. However, really the fundamental key to armor penetration is going to be velocity, especially velocity combined with the right material. So I think there's a lot more potential for armor penetration using a, a good armor piercing small caliber uh, cartridge than there is going back to something like 7.62 NATO. Uh, also that means that you don't get all of the other disadvantages of using 7.62 NATO. Mainly, it weighs a lot more and it takes a lot more space, so you can't carry nearly as much of it. 
Uh, and the second question here is RGB, who says, what special sauce did the M14 or M1A lose as opposed to the M1 Garand? That is to say, why does the Garand get praise and the M14 get derided, even in a modern context? Um, really, the well, some of it is not fair, not justified, uh, people just wanting to crap on the M14. Part of it is not, uh, part of it is simply that the M14 took 12 years to make one, basically one improvement to the M1 Garand, adding a box magazine to it, which is condemnation by faint praise, shall we say. Now the, the fundamental, the, the real reason that the M14 is disparaged, or should be, is that there were tremendous quality control problems and manufacturing problems with the M14. And that's not something that you really see with a single one-off example. Um, it's not something you necessarily really see with the M1A, but they had a really hard time getting M14s that actually worked right and were sufficiently accurate um, coming out of multiple different contractors. And that was a big part of the downfall of the M14. Uh, there's also, of course, the issue that it was its intended scope was crazy. The idea that the M14 would replace the submachine gun, the M1 carbine, the M1 Garand, the BAR, and, uh, well, not the 1919, but it would replace everything in there and act as a squad light machine gun is bonkers. It, like, it was barely able to replace the service rifle, much less, and it was just hopelessly outclassed for any of the other things that it was supposed to do. Uh, Andrew says, I bought a Carcano TS Troupe Especiale uh, carbine. My local gunsmith refused to take it in for a safety check. His reaction was really visceral on the phone. Without even seeing it, he claimed they were all prone to blowing up from day one off the production line, let alone a hundred years later. I'd not seen this in my research aside from an example rechambered as a wildcat. Can you elaborate on this claim? Uh, besides checking the headspace, is there something else I should be specifically looking for before I take it to the range? Uh, you should find a different gunsmith, because that guy is an idiot. Uh, this is the the worst kind of FUD lore uh, being recited by someone who has absolutely no idea what they're talking about. The Carcano is a perfectly safe action. They don't blow up, as you said, aside from perhaps the odd example rechambered in some weird wildcat. Uh, like, this is one of those things where it's just, oh, the Italians, they must suck, therefore their rifle must suck, therefore it probably blows up, therefore, yeah, I heard a guy say it blew up, therefore, yeah, everyone knows that they all just explode, like, when you put ammo anywhere near them. There's nothing wrong with the Carcano as a rifle. Now, um, things to look for before you take it out to shoot it, a number of things. Um, check the bore, make sure the bore isn't obstructed, make sure the bore it doesn't have a hole drilled in it. This is a, a very rare thing in the US, in fact I don't know that I've ever really heard of it in the US, but it does happen in Europe, and I know a bunch of you guys are in Europe. Um, sometimes people will deactivate guns in countries where that makes it a lot easier to own them, by say drilling a hole in the chamber or the barrel, uh, and they'll do it underneath a handguard. So that you know you take the handguard off, drill the hole, put the handguard back on, and then it it doesn't make the rifle look obviously deactivated, and so it's better in a collection. But then occasionally those things get sold without someone uh, acknowledging that, oh, by the way, there's a hole drilled in the chamber. Uh, and occasionally one of those rifles gets fired by someone who buys it thinking it's intact and goes out to shoot it. And that can have really unfortunate consequences, because uh, then it sort of will explode. Then the brass will just blow straight out that hole, if there's a handguard in the way, it will turn that handguard into shrapnel. If you are holding it over that hole, woe be unto your hand. Um, so make sure that the board doesn't have any holes in it. Uh, make sure that there isn't any substantial pitting on it. Take the action out of the stock and look at the both the top of the barrel and the underside of the barrel, because in a lot of very humid environments, which includes a lot of places Carcanos have been, uh, you may very well get uh, rust and pitting because the, the stock absorbs water and that rusts. And the top of the barrel can look fine, and the underside of the barrel can have some pretty nasty pitting to it. In theory, that's usually not that big of a deal, but if it's deep enough, it could constitute a safety hazard. Um, you will want to make sure that the bolt lugs aren't cracked. Um, close, careful inspection there. There's, it's impossible for me to point out everything that could potentially be wrong on a rifle. That's why I would always suggest 
if you don't feel confident in doing this sort of inspection yourself, take it to a gunsmith. Just find a gunsmith who is not a bigoted idiot. Patrick says, watching your videos on the Steyr Scout, would you consider an AR-10 chambered in 308 or something similar, with an emphasis on keeping the gun light, to be worthy of considering it as a Scout from a purely technical standpoint? Yes, absolutely I would, and I think you can probably build that today and have it meet the technical standards of a Scout rifle. Uh, I think in general the people who are most interested in Scout rifles are, I won't say biased against a self-loading rifle, but not particularly interested in a self-loading rifle. Um, I think there is a lot of uh, appreciation for the bolt action as a bolt action, and they're not necessarily interested in making it something different by way of going to a semi-auto. But I think a semi-auto rifle is a far more practical rifle than a bolt action for virtually any purpose. Not necessarily every purpose, but getting pretty close there. So if you can have a semi-auto that is as accurate as a bolt action, as light as a bolt action, has the same sort of optics mounting as a bolt action, same ballistic capability as a bolt action, why wouldn't you? Um, I think one of the big reasons that Cooper hung his hat on for avoiding uh, semi-autos with scout rifles in the first place was the notion that they aren't legal everywhere, and by everywhere he meant like, oh, if you, you can't take it to Africa to go hunting with. So okay, fine, but um, if you're not living or hunting in Africa, yeah, I would absolutely encourage someone who's interested in that to consider an AR-10 variant. Uh, Chris says, could you make bullets out of silver? What would they shoot like, and has anyone done it? Yes, a number of people have done it, and you can you can do it. Um, silver has a malleability somewhere in between lead and copper, so it will engage in rifling. You won't destroy the gun doing it. Um, silver has a, a density a little bit less than lead, uh, but not that much less. In theory, it actually makes a decent bullet material. Uh, obviously, the there are a couple of reasons it wouldn't. One is that it's valuable, like lead is not valuable, so it's cheap, so it makes a great projectile material. Silver, there are a lot of better things you can do with silver than turn it into a bullet and shoot it into the dirt. Um, from a technical perspective, silver has a far higher melting temperature than lead, and it also contracts a lot more than lead when it solidifies. This doesn't mean you can't make bullets out of it, but it means if you're going to, you have to have a bullet mold that is designed specifically for silver, so that your mold is oversized by the appropriate amount, so that when you when a bullet solidifies and cools, it will shrink down to the appropriate diameter, which is a pretty specific diameter for whatever caliber you want. You can't just take a if if you do take just a lead mold, fill it with silver, make a silver bullet, you'll end up with a substantially undersized bullet that isn't going to engage your rifling, it's going to have a lot of gas blow by and it's not going to work very well. Uh, this has been done by a number of people because of the vampire thing. Like, what about silver bullets? You know, people talk about them, but has anyone ever done it? I know they did it on Mythbusters, uh, and there have been a no number of other people who've tried it out. Um, and it does work, there's just no reason that you would want to do it. Let's see, Eric says, I have read that during World War I large boar hunting rifles, i.e. elephant guns, uh, were pressed into service in anti-armor roles, uh, including some aristocrats donating their personal hunting firearms to the cause. How, effect how effective were these rifles against armor? Um, so sort of, but not really. Um, this is something that happened in, with the British military. Um, the Germans didn't use tanks though, so this wasn't really an anti-armor thing. I, I know, someone's going to say that there were in fact German tanks. The Germans did not use uh, significant numbers of tanks, and they certainly didn't do it early in the war when this sort of thing was happening. The reason that they wanted these large bore rifles was because uh, the German sniping program made use of steel loopholes. You'd set up a steel plate with a little hole in it, and you could hide behind that plate, and it would be armored and bullets would bounce off of it, and so it would give some protection to snipers. But the armor wasn't like super duper armor, um, and the British found that there were some really heavy duty rifle cartridges that could punch through armor that was proof against a standard 303 ball round. And so, and they didn't have a 303 armor piercing at that point because like people hadn't done that yet. Uh, so there, and at the same time I should say there were also 
a pretty decent number of civilian hunting rifles, scoped hunting rifles, being donated uh, to the military for use as uh, early sniping rifles before the British actually got moving with a formal official sniper rifle program. So yeah, you did have, have these things happening. It was done for sniper loopholes, not tanks or other forms of armor. And it was reasonably effective for a fairly short period of time. As one might expect, once the Germans discovered that the bloody English are shooting, you know, 338, 450, 500 caliber cartridges at us, and they're going, they're blowing holes in these sniper shields, they made the sniper shield stronger until it didn't happen anymore. Um, let's see, Ed says, a bit fantastical, but here we go. You have been cast to play a role in the upcoming John Wick movie. As an armorer he comes across, what guns would you like to see him use? Keep in mind it's a movie, realism be damned. Uh, I w that would be awesome, by the way, even just a cameo in one of those scenes would be awesome. It would be a ton of fun to do. As for... So, so I took a slightly different twist on this question. There's one thing of like, what guns would I give him? Well, John Wick would not come to Ian McCollum and say, your specialty is weird, obscure, and often subpar firearms. Please give me three of your finest, or like, my finest, or not the same as most practical. John Wick would not come to me for a loadout. He would go to a modern armorer. However, what I think would be really cool to see in a John Wick movie would be uh, the two things that I came up with. One, it'd be a lot of fun to see a scene that they put together with a bolt-action rifle. Uh, you know, have have him need to get his armament out of a museum or you know my gun collection, which are kind of the same thing, and make him take monmaker clips or give him a Mosin Nagant. Let's see John Wick running Mosin Nagant stripper clips or single feeding cartridges with a magazine cut off. That kind of thing would be really neat to see in a, a you know a big budget Hollywood movie. The other thing I think would be cool would be some uh, water cooled, belt fed World War One heavy machine gun action in a John Wick movie. You know, let's let's see a Russian 1910 Maxim uh, on scene, or or a Schwarzlosa, or any of those things. I think um, the guys that that are doing those movies could come up with some really cool and creative ideas uh, to use one of those guns. Um, let's see. Next up is John, who says, "What is your exercise routine like?" Also, which of those exercises that aren't running or jogging enhanced your shooting ability the most? Uh, or shooting ability uh, more than others. So my exercise routine is uh, three days a week I jog in the morning, uh, either three and a half or five kilometers, and three days a week I do strength training, which is it's actually pretty simple. Um, basically had a, we have a setup, my wife and I, in the garage, and um, a basic set of barbells and plates and a pull-up bar. And I do a set of four different exercises each morning, and they're always, they're different each day of the week. The idea is to have one arm exercise that is a pull, like a pull-up, one arm exercise that is a push, uh, like a push-up, um, and these of course are things that you can do with bars, so overhead presses, that sort of thing. Uh, one that is a core exercise, um, something like Russian twists, um, ideally something rotary, and then one that is a leg exercise, like squats or uh, deadlift. Um, deadlift kind of covers a lot of things, but the idea is to mix up a variety of exercises, but get one of each of those four, and that kind of gives you a good overall whole body workout. Um, none of it is particularly uh, awe-inspiring in terms of, of weight that I do, but I've been doing it for boy, like five years now, and I'm very happy with the results. As for it making, as for it contributing to shooting skill, honestly, the one thing that really contributes to shooting skill for me is jogging and sprinting. It's um, cardio, building cardio. Now, there's something to be said for arm and back exercises that will allow you to simply hold a heavier than normal rifle um, in a shooting position for an extended period of time. That's a real thing. Um, that's probably the closest any of this comes to really directly improving shooting skill. A lot of it improves capability for two-gun-like stuff, where you have to carry weights, move stuff, climb over obstacles, that sort of thing. By far though, if you just want one for better shooting, better match shooting, 
sprints, sprints and jogging. I, I know they suck. Believe me, I know they suck. I don't enjoy doing them, but I like the outcome. So Neil says, why was the 22 long rifle cartridge developed with a rebated bullet? And was this done for any others? Yes, it's been done for a bunch of cartridges. And that is part of the reason why we have things like 38 caliber cartridges with 36 caliber bullets today. And the reason was the 22 long rifle and many of the other early cartridges were rimmed and they were head spaced on the rim. So you could have a nice simple chamber that was just a hole of constant diameter drilled straight through uh, your barrel or your revolver cylinder, if you're talking about a revolver. And the, the outside diameter of the casing is identical to the outside diameter of the bullet. Makes it nice and easy. You then have a step at the back of the bullet so that it can sit in the cartridge case and be crimped in and held in place. Now today, what we prefer to do, because it's more accurate, is we will actually have the bullet the same diameter as the inside of the cartridge case, not the outside. And that means that you have this, this step where the, the cartridge case ends and you've got whatever the thickness of the brass is, and then the bullet starts. And today we headspace cartridges on uh, either the front of the, the cartridge right there, if it's a straight walled cartridge, or on the shoulder if it's a, a bottlenecked cartridge like most common rifle cartridges. So um, 9 millimeter headspaces on the case mouth, 5.56 five, headspaces on the shoulder. Uh, the point being, if you're going to headspace on the case mouth, you have to have a smaller diameter bullet. And if you look in the chamber of, say, a 9 millimeter firearm, you will see a sharp step, which is where the case mouth hits. That's where the gun headspaces. That allows us to have a more consistent, accurate headspace than done with a rim. Not, rims still work. There are plenty of rimmed cartridges still, but kind of we've transitioned and in the process of that transition tended to move away from rebated bullets. Uh, our Vice says, have you considered or attempted to do factory fire, firearm factory tours, especially old versus new, to show uh, more of the changes in manufacturing over time, from forging and dedicated machines like shapers to the modern multi-axis CNC and polymer molding of today. It's something I don't go out of my way to look for anymore because I did look into this years ago. And the problem I ran into was most factories are very nervous about showing their current production tooling. In fact, most factories are very skittish about having any filming on a production floor at all. And on top of that, most factories don't have that much in the way of old tooling still lying around. So it's not really something that's conducive to me being able to get video footage. Um, it would be interesting. Uh, there aren't that many firearm factories around either, which makes it harder. There, there are a lot fewer opportunities to do that. So I kind of really have to go out of my way to make something like that happen. And it usually, uh, honestly, it usually isn't something that's an option. Um, the, the factory owners don't, don't want it to happen. And I can understand that. They all have trade secrets, they all have proprietary processes that they don't want their competitors to know about. So fair enough. Omar says, do you think we're seeing modern armies swing away from bullpups and back to traditional rifles for good? I know the Chinese have announced their new combat rifle and it's not a bullpup. Nations like France and New Zealand have abandoned bullpups for AR variants. Does the benefit of the compact nature of bullpups from mechanized warfare just not outweigh their inherent ergonomic issues anymore? I don't think it's a permanent thing. Uh, it is certainly the trend at the moment away from bullpups, but it wouldn't surprise me if in 10 or 20 years it swings back the other way. It's There is no monolithic school of thought on this sort of thing. The people doing military procurement are, they're always changing. You know, every few years there's turnover in these positions and there are people with different ideas and different experiences. And sooner or later, there will be some people who come back into a position of decision-making authority who do prefer the trade-offs of a bullpup instead of a traditional rifle. And I'm sure that we'll see, uh, we'll see them continue to pop up in military service here and there. I think they will always be a minority compared to traditional rifles. But um, the other issue we have today is there aren't that many uh, of them in like the top tier of military potential rifles. So you have the Steyr AUG. Um, 
you have the Tavor, and then you've got kind of some second tier stuff uh, from some of the other companies that don't have as much of an established reputation or manufacturing capability, like Desert Tech in the US, uh, and there are like the VHS2 in um, Croatia. I, so a country that's looking for a new rifle, they have a lot more, kind of a lot better options for a traditional rifle right now than a bullpup, and that I think influences the decision as well. Fruit Bat, uh, Fruit Bat 44, says the ASP and the Devel both feature transparent panels to enable the user to keep count of rounds. Uh, what's your opinion on this feature and why do you think it never caught on? I think it didn't catch on because it's not as useful as, as it kind of appears on the surface. So you're talking about uh, grip panels on pistols that are transparent or translucent. So you can look at the gun and see exactly how many cartridges are still in the magazine. The problem is doing so requires completely abandoning your your shooting position and your grip. Uh, you have to, you know, your, your hand is covering those transparent panels and you have to open your grip up and point the grip at yourself to be able to see how many rounds are in the gun. And that's not that much faster than pulling the mag to check it and putting the mag back. And I think the issue is if you have the time and the need to do a check like that, you usually have enough time to just pull the mag and look at it, or pull the mag and reload it with a brand new one. The transparent grip panels don't, they, they give you a benefit in a small number of edge cases, but it's not that many. Now one could argue that there's not really any downside to this, and I think you're right, there really isn't much of a downside. There used to be when transparent materials were substantially less durable than opaque ones, but today we do see, for example, Magpul offering PMAGs that have a transparent window in them so you can see how much ammunition is in the mag. And those are popular, but again, for me at least, if I'm using one of those, I'm using it mostly to make sure that the mag's fully loaded when I'm starting off with it, say in a competition, rather than necessarily looking at it to see how many rounds I have left in the middle of a course of fire. And the window's job in that case is done just as well by having a little, little vent, a little window hole, witness hole at the bottom on the spine of the magazine where I can see if it's fully loaded. By the way, one interesting, uh, ex one, one interesting other example here of a similar sort of concept are the Japanese Type 96 Nambu magazines, which actually have uh, numbers, the last couple of numbers printed on the follower of the magazine, which this is a top mounted magazine. So if you're on the gun, you're staring straight at the back of the magazine spine. And I think it's three, two, and one are marked on the follower through this little witness hole. So when the magazine's almost empty, you get an actual remaining round count showing up right in your peripheral vision, which is, sounds kind of cool, but nobody else has really done that. The British didn't do it with the Bren. Um, I think again, it was kind of useful in a few edge cases, but not, not enough to justify changing the design for everyone else. Will says, you have spoken of your dislike of three round burst on anything but the Super Dute 11, aka the Kraut Space Magic, he means the HKG 11, uh, and your praise of constant recoil in full auto, would combining a constant recoil system with a three round burst render the whole concept more practical? No, I don't think so. Um, my, my problem with three round burst is that it is a training crutch. Uh, there is nothing that three round burst does that learning how to manipulate the gun won't do better. Three round burst tends to have a deleterious effect on trigger pull, and it exists only because militaries are not confident that they can train someone to let go of the trigger after a couple of rounds. And so a three round burst I find takes options away. Uh, maybe I wanted four or five. Well now I've got to do two separate trigger pulls. Maybe I wanted two. I can't really maybe do that. Uh, the trigger pull sucks to begin with. Um, it's not that hard to learn to control the trigger on a machine gun, especially if your job involves shooting a machine gun. So the three round burst is just a crutch for conscript forces that are getting next to no effective training. And so I would prefer to not see it on any gun that I'm ever using. Christopher 
Ooh, Christopher says, you've got one hour to arm the Alamo defenders with any small arms of your choice, but in that hour you'll have to issue the weapon, the ammo, and use the remaining time to train them on these guns, so time will be tight. What do you give them? So the Alamo was 1836. There would have been a general familiarity with flintlock and percussion lock guns, probably. Uh, probably more flintlocks than percussion, um, actually in the hands of the defenders. The concept of the percussion cap would have been known to them. So there are two schools of thought here. On the one hand, you could say, well, let's give them something like really, really modern, you know, as, as good as we have today. Let's give them some Mag 58s. Uh, you could say AR-15s, but hey, these guys are facing down a really large number of attackers with a generally open field of fire. Uh, yeah, you can give them rifles, but the machine guns are the thing that'll really help them, allow them to defend that fortified or sort of fortified location. Uh, the the trade-off there is that it's a really effective gun, but you've only got an hour to train someone who has never seen a self-contained cartridge except perhaps a paper one, in use of a belt-fed machine gun and its stoppages and how to feed it and how to run it. That's a little... that, that might be asking too much. I, I'm thinking that you could get a good enough improvement in the Alamo's defensive capabilities by issuing something that was only about one generation ahead of what they were facing down. And so my thought is issue them Remington rolling blocks. This is going to give them a massive advantage in range, a massive advantage, well, a pretty darn significant advantage in accuracy. They'll still get a huge advantage in rate of fire because it is a cartridge firing gun. And the rolling block is a very simple action. Uh, it's kind of intuitive how to use the thing. So I, I think you could get away with an hour's worth of training to make guys combat effective with a Remington rolling block and they'd be engaging the Mexican army so far outside of the Mexican army's effective firearms range that I think that would still have a, a fundamental change on the outcome of the battle. So I will go with the Remington rolling block. I don't think you even need to go with a, like a magazine rifle, like a Mauser. I think just a single shot, metallic cartridge, smokeless powder. Let's, let's be clear about this, and the rolling block was made with smokeless powder at, at the end of its production line. You know, give them one in 7 Mauser, um, seven, actually 7 Mauser would be a perfect cartridge. Relatively light recoil, flat shooting, accurate. Um, they will, the Mexican army would not know what hit them. Uh, Matt says, Ian, you were supposed to be a judge at the Ohio Gun Collectors uh, Show, Ohio Gun Collectors Association, show earlier this year before COVID shut everything down. Will you be a guest judge at the show when things open back up? I certainly hope so. Um, I am anticipating doing that next year. Uh, it was scheduled for, I believe, May. Um, Ohio Gun Collectors is one of the largest shows and collector groups in the United States. And their big annual show, they have a, a series of judged display competitions amongst their members. And it was quite the honor to be asked to be one of the three judges for the show. So yes, I would love to do it, hopefully. And I can't see why we wouldn't be back to normality by next May. Um, I'll be able to do that. Ooh. Uh, let's see if I can pronounce this. Haushuan? I'm probably getting that completely wrong. But... Uh, it says, I am really curious as to why modern handguns are often equipped with night sights or sights with colored inserts for better visibility in a dark environment, but this trend didn't really occur on rifle sights, although a few rifles did have night sights. The reason is people aren't expecting to use a rifle at close range in the dark. A handgun is always really kind of at close range, and your target is going to be close enough, presumably with a handgun, that if you could see the, the sights, you could engage your target with it. With a rifle, if it's dark out, your chances of being able to see someone at rifle distance are very slim, so why bother? And yes, there were there have been some instances where rifles do have night sights, because sometimes the targets are up close. Uh, or if you've got, in a military situation, if you've got a whole squad of guys uh, shooting, well, someone may hit something, you know, even if you can't see an individual target. So it's worth, why not give them the capability? Um, 
The other issue is handguns are harder to aim without seeing the sights than rifles. With a rifle you've got this extra point of contact on your cheek that helps you line up a rifle on target instinctively uh, much better than a handgun that's just kind of floating around out here in space. So uh, night sights are more valuable on handguns, and handguns are more likely to be of actual use in the dark. So that's why they are the ones that get night sights. Uh, Pete says, how many spare barrels and how much 8mm link were considered normal for a German infantry squad during World War II? Did it differ between the MG34 and the MG42? Uh, different organizations, the Heer, the Wehrmacht, the Fallschirmjäger, uh, given the centrality of the general purpose machine gun to the German infantry squad's concept of fire and movement, it would seem like uh, it would seem to call for quite a bit of ammo. I was discussing this with some soldiers at a museum in Normandy. One was adamant that they carried two barrels per team, the other was adamant they carried six spare barrels, which sounds rather much. I did some looking on this. Uh, there is a collector grade book called MG34 and MG42 German Universal Machine Guns, written by Folke Mervang, which is an excellent reference uh, book on this subject. And he has information, which I have copied down on my cheat sheet here, for two discrete uh, uses of the machine gun. Uh, he didn't have any information about like the Fallschirmjager versus the Wehrmacht, so I don't know about that. However, they do distinguish between the use of the gun as a light machine gun and the use as a heavy machine gun. As a light machine gun it's something that's being fired off the bipod, as a heavy machine gun uh, it's being used in a tactically a different environment and it's being set up on a Lafat mount for precision much longer range fire. So those are the two different use cases. Uh, in, a, in its light role uh, the machine gun would be part of a nine-man element. Uh, you have the gunner who's going to carry the gun with a 50 round uh, transit drum on it. You then have your assistant gunner <coughs> who is carrying one spare barrel and 500 rounds of belted ammo. Uh, you have your number three gunner who is your ammo bearer uh, who is carrying two, two ammo cans which is 600 rounds of belted ammo and another spare barrel. And then riflemen four through nine in the squad have an unspecified amount of ammunition. So your main three-man element with the gun in a light roll are going to have 1150 rounds and two spare barrels. Uh, and that's the same for the 34 and the 42 because the ammo weighs the same. In theory you'd want more ammo with the 42 probably because it shoots faster, but if you could carry more ammo for the 42 you'd make the guys with the 34 carry more ammo too because who doesn't want more ammo? Uh, in the heavy configuration you have your squad leader uh, who is carrying a spare barrel and 300 rounds, uh, one ammo can, and he directs the squad. You have your gunner uh, <coughs> who has the gun. You have your assistant gunner is carrying the Lafette mount in lieu of ammo and barrels because that Lafette mount is heavy and bulky. Uh, you then have three separate ammo carrying men designated for ammo and they're each carrying 600 rounds. Uh, two of them are carrying spare barrels, so in the heavy configuration uh, your, your immediate squad, not counting anyone who's got you know, extra riflemen who could carry some spare ammo with them, your immediate squad is going to be carrying 2100 rounds of ammunition, 2150 if you count the belt and the drum uh, in the gun, and three spare barrels. So a little more ammo and one extra barrel compared to the light config. The procedure, the doctrine for changing the barrels was with the MG34 every 250 rounds of rapid fire you would change the barrel. That balances out reasonably nicely to basically shoot a belt. When you reload the belt also change the barrel. And yeah, a barrel will go way more than 250 rounds. The whole point is you are continuously changing the barrels so that you can always cycle through and you're always cooling off the, the two hottest barrels so that you never have a, a, a presentation of the gun with a barrel that's too hot to use. Uh, with the MG42 because of its higher rate of fire Doctrine was change the barrel every 150 rounds. So every half ammo can change out the barrel and that's if you're engaging in rapid fire. So there you go. If you would like to know more about these machine guns, Folky Mervang's book is an excellent source, by far the best source that I'm aware of on the subject. Uh, next up is Bert, who says, I'm a new collector and I need to clean up some past mistakes. Uh, what's the best way to sell uh, guns in my collection? 
It's nothing expensive, just random forgotten weapons. Uh, local gun shop, online, gun shows, forums. There are there are a couple different options, um, and I I've, actually I've used all of them. So uh, you have your local gun shop where you can take something in and sell it on consignment. To me, that is best done if you just really don't want to deal with it. Um, if you don't want to deal with shipping, if you don't want to deal with interacting with your potential buyer, it's a very easy option. That's really, it's the easiest of all the options. Your local gun shop should take a 10 or 15% commission cut. They will probably let you choose the price of the rifle subject to a reality check because they don't want you to price it so high that it just sits on their shelf forever taking up space. They don't want you to price it so low that it goes out the door and they could have made more money on it. So that's nice and easy. Um, you know, if you're going to go on vacation for a month and you're like, oh, I really wanted to move this rifle, well, take it to the gun shop, give it to them on consignment. It may take a while to sell. It's easy, but it's not going to be necessarily super fast. But they'll take care of all the work for you. Just don't lose your receipt. Like, make sure you remember that they had your gun to sell. Um, you have online forums like uh, gunboards.com. I really like those. I bought a bunch of stuff there. Um, that is best if you're willing to do packing and shipping. Uh, you will pay no commission to anybody, so you get the full value of your price, but you need to know exactly what price you think the gun is worth. Because you set the price and someone will yay or nay it. So what a lot of people will do is set the price high and then spend a couple weeks on a forum uh, you know, bumping the price down in small increments until it finally sells. By the way, you are better off setting your price at a reasonable rate the first time, moving it quickly. If you've got this thing that keeps bumping every week for like two months, people lose interest in looking at it. And you will actually sell the gun more the first time if you set a reasonable, for more the first time if you set a reasonable price than if you try to set it too high and increment it down until you get the highest possible actual selling price. Um, Online auctions, like Gun Broker, are another good option. Uh, you will pay a commission there, but you have the auction thing going for you, which in my experience has been a pretty darn good uh, judge of what is the market value for a gun. Sometimes you'll lose out a bit. Um, sometimes you'll get lucky and you'll get a couple people fighting over a rifle and you'll get a higher price than you would have expected. Uh, my recommendation in general for these places is start with no reserve. Start the gun at a penny and just let the auction go where it will. Um, because in the long run, that will get you the best result the most often, um, as opposed to setting a reserve price that maybe is too high or setting a buy it now price that maybe is too low. Just let the auction thing do its thing. Uh, it's relatively fast. It's whatever the auction cycle is, probably a week. I have had myself, like virtually, I, I've had just a tiny number of actual problems using online auctions like that, but very rare. I've had overall excellent experience doing that. Take good pictures. This ought to be obvious, but if there's something wrong with the gun, disclose it, because much easier to disclose it up front, and you'll have more confident buyers than trying to hide it, and then having someone angry at you and wanting to return the gun to you, and you don't want to deal with that. Just be honest about it. Put it out there, good pictures, highlight the good stuff, show the bad stuff. You, know. um, you also have the commercial auction companies like Rock Island or Morphe's. Uh, they can get more exposure uh, for something, especially a high value item. The downside there is they are going to take a cut, although it's not necessarily going to be more of a cut than you'd use on an, you know, an online seller like Gunbroker, um, but it will also take time because you have to get the gun to them. They have to do their photography, do their cataloging. They will place it in their next appropriate auction, which could be several months away. So to my mind, that's most effective for something that is very high value, um, like a machine gun um, or a really rare collectible piece. Uh, although some of that stuff can do really well on a place like Gun Broker as well. Uh, it's also ideal if it's something that you don't want to have to deal with shipping, but you want to get more attention to than your local gun shop could give it. If you've got like a Maxim gun on a tripod and it weighs 120 pounds all told and you don't want to deal with trying to crate that up and ship it, that's one of the really nice services provided by the, the big commercial auction houses is 
they've got they've got shipping departments. They'll pick it up from you. They'll ship it to whoever buys it, and you won't have to deal with FedExing a hundred pound machine gun. Hopefully that uh, that that went a bit longer than I expected. So hopefully that's uh, good useful information for you guys. Uh, we're getting close to the end here. David says it occurred to me as I started typing a quote. Any plans for a video on XYZ rifle type of question? Do you tend to discard these types of questions? If you are one of the folks on Patreon uh, who is uh, submitting questions, I do what I do is I'll uh, put up a post requesting questions um, a week or so before I plan to film one of these videos. If you are on Patreon and you see that and you are thinking, well, I, I wonder if Ian would ever do a video on blank. The answer is, if I haven't done it already. And if it's not a super boring gun, then yes, I will. My ultimate goal, and this is perhaps unachievable, but still it keeps me pointed in the right direction, my ultimate goal is to do all the guns. So if I haven't done it, yes I'm going to. There, uh, there are sometimes uh, problems getting a hold of a gun. You know, If you're asking me have I done a Russian cosmonaut space pistol, no. Yes I'd love to. They're not floating all around all over the place, so it's a matter of I have to get my hands on one. Believe me, as soon as I get my hands on a Russian cosmonaut space pistol, I will absolutely do a video on it. Every once in a while, I'll get someone asking about a gun that's commercial and pretty simple. Like if it's a a commercial youth 22 rifle, uh, yeah, if it comes down to it, I'd do a video on that, but it'd be way way down on the list of priorities. So for those of you on Patreon, yes, I do discard all those questions because they're a little simplistic to put that answer into a video like this. Of, yep, I'm going to do that, but I don't know when. So, uh, Sean says, why didn't the US undertake a large-scale conversion of the 1919 A4 and or A6 machine guns to 7.62 NATO? I know the Navy had done the Mark 21 Mod 0, and there were some updated versions for tanks, but why not just convert all of them for ammo compatibility with guns like the M60? It seems a bit wasteful. The biggest reason, is, so you pointed out here the M60, the M60 was already in development when the 7.62 NATO cartridge was adopted. So people knew, the military knew, that they're going to be getting rid of these Brownings and replacing them with M60s. And that was one of the big big reasons is we're just we're not going to be using these guns anymore so why put in the effort to convert the cartridge and then immediately throw the gun out now yes some guns are going to be kept in reserve for various organizations but there's also a ton of old ammunition and so what better way to balance everything out than to be able to use this old ammo for training national guard reserve type stuff uh, with the older guns that are in reserve uh, rather than retrofit all the guns to the new cartridge, and then, then we just have this useless stockpile of ammo that we've already paid for but we can't really use. Also, the conversion process is not quite as simple as it might seem. Now, the Israelis did it in a nice simple way. The Israelis uh, redesigned the, the original 30-06 link to take 308. Uh, the, the diameter of the cartridge is a little bit different at the shoulder, and 308 rounds don't fit in standard 30-06 1919 links, or belts really, although you can kind of make them work in belts. So for the Israelis and the South Africans, it was kind of a simple solution. We just convert that, and presto, we just use our links. The problem for the US was with the M60 and the 76, well, with the M60 specifically, they adopted a new design of link. The M60 was a push-through link where the Browning guns were pull-out links. And this means that the M60 has a link that is not uh, fully, doesn't fully wrap around the cartridge. It's open on one side for the bolt to be able to push a cartridge out of the link. The Browning guns don't work with that style of link. Uh, it requires, you can make them work, the Canadians actually made them work. The Canadians redesigned the 1919 to work with 7.62 NATO M60 style links, and they spent a tremendous amount of money on it in the process. It was a, a very labor-intensive conversion, but they did it because they were going to use Brownings more than perhaps the United States was planning to. Uh, so for the US side, if you're going to... so we know the guns aren't going to be used a lot. In addition to converting the guns, now we also have to maintain stockpiles of two separate links 
that are not going to be mutually usable. You can't put the 1919 links in the M60, you can't put the M60 links in the 1919. It just wasn't worth it. And our last question is from Brendan, who says, do you think that CMMG's radial delayed blowback system has potential applications for intermediate or full powered rifle cartridges, or is it best suited to pistol calibers? I have not done the engineering background on this. Um, I suspect CMMG maybe has. My gut is that it probably isn't well suited for anything other than a pistol caliber, because it doesn't give you that much mechanical delay. If you look at the systems that are suited for rifle calibers, like the um, the lever delay of the FAMAS, and of course the roller delay of the HK system, those are systems where you've got more force necessary to move a larger amount of mass a longer distance uh, to delay opening of the breech than you have with CMMG's um, rotary delay system. Uh, it works well for pistol caliber where you don't need that much delay. I could be wrong on this, but my, my gut feeling is probably not ideal for larger cartridges. So uh, that is our Q&A for this month. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you would like to submit a question for next month's Q&A, hop over to Patreon. I have a link in the description text below here. Um, sign up there. You can be one of the fantastic people who helps support Forgotten Weapons and make sure it's here uh, continuing to go forward forever for you guys. Thanks for watching.